I see some familiar faces. Hi, Elisa. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Shupi. One more minute, perhaps, and then we'll start. Hi, Julie. Nice to see you, or not to see you, nice to have you here. Okay, I think I can start welcoming everyone uh, while some more people will, will join us. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, um, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to this session, looking at uh, why new approaches to relationships, resources, and risk are key to strengthening grassroots activism in these testing times. Um, going to be your moderator today. My name is Clara Bosco, and I'm a senior advisor with uh, Civicus Global Alliance. Um, so while we wait for some more people to join, let me perhaps just go through some uh, uh, typical uh, housekeeping announcements. Um, and so um, there is simultaneous interpretation, uh, and you can see in this slide um, how you can set it up. So basically, I mean, by now, many of you would know, but there is a button at the bottom of your screen that says interpretation, and you can, um, you know, set there the, your preferred language. Um, important to know that this session will last approximately 90 minutes, um, and we will have a break more or less around um, half time. Uh, the break is for everyone, uh, but in particular for the interpreters who will be um, supporting us throughout throughout the day, uh, throughout the session. Um, in terms of the agenda, um, we're going to start, of course, by uh, welcoming the panel, uh, introduce, introducing you a little bit this topic, why for us it's an important conversation to have and what we've learned uh, over these last years from our own journey. Um, and then we'll uh, uh, dive uh, into our conversation with our guest speakers and we'll unpack more these three key elements that uh, we will share why we think are key, relationships, resources and risks. There will be a moment for um, Q&A, &A, so uh, throughout the session, by all means, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box. You see that there are two boxes. One is Q&A, one is chat. Uh, you're welcome to post comments in the chat as well, but if you have specific questions for the panel, please use the Q&A um, box because that will allow us to more easily uh, identify what are questions for the panel and then um, address them during the Q&A moment. Uh, and then we'll be, uh, there will be a moment for a round of closing reflections from, from all of the speakers um, and, um, and be the, the session. I hope it will be um, um, a good one, of course. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so before we go any further, perhaps uh, I'd like to welcome um, our guest speakers. I'm really excited about um, the incredible panel that we have today. Uh, I will let them introduce themselves more properly later on. So for now, we'll just um, welcome them um, um, uh, here. Uh, so welcome, Anne-Louise Karstens, uh, head of uh, Global Social Movement Center with Action Aid Denmark, 
Benjamin Neymar Krause, Social Movements and Collective Action Advisors, Advisor with USAID, Laura Garcia, President and CEO of Global Green Grants Fund, Maria Amalia Souza, founder um, of uh, Fundo Casa Socioambiental, um, Nino Augre uh, Kelitz, I hope I haven't mispronounced, um, co founder of the Cessna Collaborative Fund, and Tendisai Chiguedere, learning manager with uh, Trust Africa. Welcome, uh, very, very everyone, and I'm so looking forward to uh, chat with you um, uh, later, uh, later on. So, um, I'm going to start sharing briefly uh, my screen uh, because we wanted to, uh, I'm always really bad at this, so bear with me. We wanted to, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. We just wanted really to share with you a bit of why for us at Civicus, this is an important conversation. And as I said, uh, what we've heard and what we've learned um, over these last years. And so one thing or the departure point of this is uh, over the last decade, we've been witnessing a progressive um, wave um, of, of activism uh, through mass mobilization, through more people-led efforts, um, moving more fluidly, more quickly to meet um, you know, uh, multiple interconnected crises, um, which, you know, are, are, are emerging and were there already, but are emerging as really a, a new wave of organizing more in, in more in new and in different ways, more informally, more horizontally, and that have been really at the forefront of change and resistance and, uh, um, and are probably or our departure point, at least five years ago, was that are probably disconnected from the more established international support ecosystem. And uh, and that uh, there was a need, there really was a need to understand better how to connect more meaningfully with these different types of formations and how to make sure that their essential roles, you know, be it... Uh, in, in their in their role as advocates and and, and 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 watchdogs, modifying unfair laws, driving policy change, holding duty bearers to account, uh, crafting solutions with the communities that they represent in whatever ways that there is more in, intentional um, and tailored avenues of solidarity and support that can really meet their needs, meet their ambitions. And um, and that can and that can provide the kind of um, solidarity uh, for those struggles. So um, at the same time, we acknowledge that um, there is a, a growing crisis in terms of civic space restrictions, and many of these groups that we have been uh, exchanging with, which are operating really at the intersection of civic space restrictions and. Um, and structural exclusion and discrimination are the, the, the ones that are most often targeted, uh, you know, uh, uh, through, you know, re regulatory, uh, regulatory, uh, in regular, you know, sorry, sorry, through restrictive regulations, through censorship, through more or less subtle tactics to threaten them, to restrict their organizing, to silence their dissent. And so uh, for us at Civicus, this is a very important sort of formation within civil society that should receive more attention and for whom more tailored and concerted efforts should be um, organized from the international support ecosystem. So these were kind of the questions or dilemmas that we started to sort of grappling with when we really started to you know work more systematically around this work stream around this area no and so uh, what in what ways can the support ecosystem more meaningfully connect with these groups meet them where they are many of these groups or some of these groups don't even identify with civil society don't mingle in those spaces there was this assumption no, that it's really hard to connect from 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 the more traditional and established international um, civil society and philanthropic organizations. 
in what ways can external allies support their agency, their autonomy and resiliency? So the emphasis is that, you know, being allies and being external allies means that there are some roles that can be played no, in solidarity, but there needs to be that mindfulness that, you no, know, we're talking about external allies and we're talking about mostly supporting the agency and the autonomy of, of these groups and their movements. And then, of course, what would be suitable avenues, approaches, mechanisms you know, that could allow this um, connecting better and mobilizing and channeling uh, better resources and solidarity. So just to let you know, and I definitely won't enter into the details that's looking at these questions, we've been trying over the last years to test a few approaches be it in identifying um, gaps and needs, producing landscape analysis, co-designing prototypes of solutions and mechanisms, co-creating campaigns with activists to mobilize solidarity, testing a resourcing mechanism with young activists. We've done a range of different things, all to always sort of together uh, with a grassroots group, a cross section of grassroots groups of different geographies from different kinds of struggles. Uh, and, um, and it has been for us, of course, a very eye-opening journey in terms of the things we've learned and the kind of wrong assumption, you know, the, the ch challenging our own wrong assumptions, our own cultural biases in, in how we were uh, approaching us, uh, the, you know, this, this, this uh, line of work and our own and our own role in this. Uh, and just to say that, you know, there's been many, many things we've done. We've engaged with hundreds of, um, with, of, of activists to, as I said, co-curate, co-design um, dialogues, uh, prototypes, campaigns, uh, analysis and, and whatnot. And we've engaged also with many kind of allies uh, or like-minded organizations, also with a range of donors and, and, and INGOs who were more or less you know, interrogating or 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 committed to similar um, to similar agenda. So all this to say that this sort of all these various kinds of activities, initiatives, analysis have have often pointed to three key aspects. You know, and these are the aspects that we'd like to discuss or to exchange with relationships, resources, and um, and risks. Um, so when we talk about um, uh, this, um, there's of course a role, or or a particular, um, my, uh, yeah, a particular role that one has to 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 think about for um, what we are calling intermediaries. So those bodies that are avenues or conduits that are more directly or should be more directly in touch with um, with uh, with grassroots uh, groups. And, and, and would really, really need to be mindful of the kinds of relationships and relational cultures that they set with these groups, be more mindful of the types of resources and enabling resources that might be necessary and needed, and more mindful of the various nuances when one thinks about risk and talks about risk. So there's a lot to unpack here, and, and I'm sure that the the, the, the guest speakers will have a lot to say, but just to say that for us, um, th there's no, no doubt that having done different things, th th they all point to these three key elements or some of the elements, not the only elements, but some of the elements that clearly need to be considered when one thinks about how to be a better ally, how to be in better solidarity, how to mobilize better resources for grassroots groups. Um, um, what we've heard um, re recurrently is that there's a lot of distance, uh, distance uh, that is perceived from, uh, from the activists, uh, a distance that is not just physical, but is also cultural. The way you now the, the sort of grant making organizations or the INGOs or even the bank donors think and operate feels really different, distant. Uh, difficult to understand from, um, from, from activists. And the kinds of realities that they experience also show the kind of distance between what, what they need and how they experience the, the potential you know, partnership or relationship with some of these 
organizations and the and the kind of support that is offered. Um, so I won't go into the details. Uh, of course, we don't have time, but um, it all really ends up uh, being perceived as very extractive relationships. There are no opportunities to connect meaningfully other than applying to a grant, responding to a survey, writing a report, one-sided, quite oppressive in the demands, disproportionate, unsafe also in the lack of consideration for the implications of sharing some of the information and not knowing what's going to happen with that information and very much transactional. They start and they end with a grant oftentimes and that's, and that's it. And, and so um, on the other hand as well, the various challenges that some of the institutions know that would be uh, considering supporting um, grassroots groups directly or indirectly, you know, by investing in perhaps other types of, of conduits or intermediaries, I don't know how they want to call them. Um, they have other sets of challenges um, of, of all sorts and, 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 and of, of, of different kinds, you know, but all these can, can, can end up in either because of the difficulties and the distance and the biases, um, it can end up either in very few resources being intentionally invested for these groups and therefore not arriving to these groups or the ones that are available because they are available in general and not specifically considering the difficulties of this group, not being accessible by these groups. And then there's a lot of risk of co-option or loss of autonomy in the way the, no, the grants or the relationships are conceived by some. So just to say, this is something we've heard a lot in terms of bad experiences, now the bad experiences with uh, in trying to approach or in or in engaging with a range of intermediaries or or what they call back donors. So this is just an example of uh, from 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 an activist no? how they experience their relationship with some of 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 these allies or you know or supporters. So beyond the project, there is nothing attached to those relationships. And so what we've heard when it comes to relationships is that the, absolutely what I said, no, they don't have, they can't be transactional. This is super important. Many of grassroots organizers, for, for, for grassroots organizers, the relationship and working through relationships is an essential part of how they work and how they understand, you know, uh, being in, a lot, in solidarity and partnership. So uh, for them, Trans trans transactional rela uh, relationships are really difficult to understand, are problematic, and actually hinder their own trust towards possible allies. What uh, should happen more that is not happening is um, that there's a need to humanize these relationships. There's a need to humanize these processes through more intentional spaces for, for people to get to meet to understand who are the people behind these institutions and probably for the institutions to understand better the people behind these organizations or these movements. And that's something that doesn't happen that often, at least from what we've heard. No, there aren't spaces that are just made for that, to connect, to understand each other, that feel safe, to share uh, about our uh, own journeys, to be vulnerable, but also to then uh, collectively, more collectively build visions for change and solutions, no? So as I said, there seems to be very limited spaces other than a few invited spaces where probably our funders exchanging with each other and inviting a couple of activists to share a few of their views, but that's not exactly the type of spaces that, that we've heard, no, where are needed to, as I said, build more cure build more trusted relationships and, and, and create more avenues and opportunities to build collective visions and solutions. And what we've heard, of course, is that decolonizing the sector, the international aid and development sector is inevitably vital for this kind of transformation. So it's of course very much ingrained with that type of, of conversation, with type of unlearning and relearning 
that needs to happen to really be able to transform the cultures that the culture that is behind these kind of approaches. Again, uh, moving to the resources part, this is and maybe Laura, you know, you know the activist <laughs> that shared this um, this quote, this this thought with us, but. There's an aspect also about what are the kinds of resources that are needed and how does the support ecosystem understand the kinds of needs that groups have and the people behind this group have. You know? So what we've heard is that, uh, and I think here, you know, some of these things are probably a mantra that many of us are keep on repeating over and over again, but it's it's okay to repeat them one more time, why not? But it's really necessary to offer accessible resources. And by accessible, we mean really considering the realities and the needs of the groups in the very context where they operate, not um, tailored also, the kind of offerings have to be tailored to these groups, to the moment where they find themselves in their, um, you know, in their organizing, in their, in their life cycle as well. Um, but also nurturing. And so we're talking about, of course, funds, flexible, accessible, that could cater, and this we've heard a lot, for institutional strengthening. And when I'm, what I mean by that, some, sometimes, and again, it depends on each and every type of or, or grassroots group, but some might be willing to register and to, um, and to grow a, a step forward. And they might just need some resources and accompaniment just for that. And it's very, very difficult with the projectified system to actually be able to access some extra support to, uh, to be able, for example, to do that or to cover the cost of opening a bank account. These are all things that, by the way, are preconditions for receiving, for example, uh, grants uh, from, from various donors. So uh, this kind of resources, this type of thinking when also investing in in with with funding, but also thinking about the sustainability. So funds that can be used by these groups to set themselves up to become more sustainable, even more autonomous, and most importantly for activists' well-being. And by well-being, we mean holistic well-being from the livelihood. There's very little consideration about the fact that for for some grassroots activists, this is a you know this is a full-time job, and that needs to be dignified with with a salary. That there needs to be other kinds of support to the well-being of, of activists, um, you know, mental well-being. We know that very well, but also um, the the yeah the social well-being. So really allow them to connect. Having networks that they can rely on is an incredible resource of resilience in 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 you know, in, in many in many in many occasions. So all sorts of resources flexibly conceived to think to go to cater for activist well-being in the most broad term uh, possible uh, possible then of course there are also in kind goods or services we've heard from organizers of movements that of you know sometimes they need quickly some support and and that is maybe you know providing a lot of uh, face masks or well, that was the case now the example that i remember and that was easier to be receiving that in kind, just give us the head mask, the face mask, than to give us a grant for that, which would require us to do the procurement and, and we are organizing quickly. So there are, of course, instances where also in kind goods or services are, are, are necessary. And then sustained accompaniment. And that's really difficult to describe. It's really something more tailored that goes with their relationship. What type of accompaniment might they need depending on where they are, depending on what, what's going on. Uh, um, and, and more tailored mentorship. We piloted, for example, um, a, a mentorship scheme through the Youth Action Lab that was, I think, valued very much where uh, some of the some of the activists identify themselves as so mentors. That and in, in the case of young activists, it's an important resource also not to allow them to 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 create relationships also through you know, mentorship opportunities with other um, with other um, uh, activists or, or or members of the movements that they could you know become mentors. Um, and they were you know handpicking some that they would uh, be keen to. Uh, engage and, and and 
and cultivate a relationship with, and that was a very valued resource. So just to say, you know, mentorships, you can think creatively, but sustain accompaniment and mentorship is certainly something that's needed. And then access to, you know, information, know-how, and networks. One thing, because I think all of these probably resonates with many of you, nothing new, but for, for, for us, what stood out perhaps was this, um, with uh, this need and, and, and this valuing of, of spaces, both, as I said, spaces that offer opportunities to connect with other groups, with donors, with partners, and to co-create solutions, resourcing mechanisms together, spaces like these. And then other types of spaces that are more for activists to connect with other members of the movement or, or even with other movements in their territories without any Agenda, but really just again to cultivate relationships, to, to have a moment of respite, good time, uh, and feel part of a community. That was something that we tested again through, through some of these pilots that I've mentioned, uh, and that um and 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 uh, was very much sort of demanded by by activists and and valued by by activists. We've just released even a toolkit curated by them on. It's called jam sessions. It's a way they imagine you know, these spaces to really respite, connect with with others, and and um, and re-energize. Really, these are other quotes of other of other grassroots activists, which are more talking about risks and the impact on views around risks. Right, uh, the aspect of the stigma that activists face for being activists and how in some countries, for example, there are more opportunities to receive support or to enter into partnerships if one offers oneself more as an advocate than as an activist because of that stigma. But also, uh, for example, the need to always show credentials and paperwork as, as a way to be accept, not considered um, an eligible or trustworthy counterpart and, and partner. You know? these, these, these are things that I think um, just few of the various things that we've heard, you know? just to give you a couple of examples. So when we talk about risk, of course, it's important to understand what risks are we talking about? Whose risks are we talking about? On the side of the activists, there are so many layers huh? that one could consider. Um, internal to their movements, on the operating environment, as, I, as, as I've mentioned, no civic space uh, crisis is really getting worse, particularly for some of these groups. Uh, the aspect of the stigma that really hinders solidarity and resources. There are also misconceptions, or at least internalized misconceptions, that is, it's actually not okay to ask, for example, for money for own salary or for own personal costs while, you know, working on on these causes. And so there's a lot there um, to unpack. No? There are different kinds of stigma uh, that, um, that make this difficult. Um, uh, the risk of burnout, the consequence of not acting, of course, because of burnout, because of the external context restrictions, because of for perhaps some lack of resources when they are needed, et cetera, et cetera. And then the risks associated with, um, you know, donors, donors, very restrictive views and frameworks, no, and and what happens uh, when some requirements are not met, and you know the fact that some partnerships are discontinued or some grants are not reimbursed, and these kinds of things. So different different levels, different layers uh, to consider, and at the same time, no, if, if we put ourselves in the shoes of back donors, I don't know, and 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 cascading from there to some intermediaries you now who have to some some somehow adhere to some of these frameworks um the very frameworks that the donors define oftentimes are centered more than anything on their own reputation and legal compliance right and when we're talking about more the programmatic or the context risks that they define in their frameworks they are very much or oftentimes externally Defined, no? defined by actors that are external and, and, and by their perceptions. There's also this results-based framework that is very popular uh, amongst uh, the donor community, 
that gives a pressure to show results. And this is difficult to reconcile you know, with organizing patients, organizing work. And so uh, there are some um, mismatches there that are really fundamental that make it really difficult uh, to reconcile. And that's why you, know, you see a discomfort with ambiguity or with failure refraining from funding some causes or some groups that could be seen as controversial. Uh, and then this at least, uh, at least, um, how do you say that in English? Um, uh, ah. Anyways, this um, uh, unintentional, but this is not the word that I wanted to say, lack of trust in, for example, new formation, recently established formations, because there's no trade, there's no track record, there's no you know, paperwork, uh, they're maybe not registered. Um, so this happens a lot with youth-led groups. Youth-led groups recently established, um, there's very diff it's very difficult for them to meet requirements and criteria. There isn't much trust because of, of you know, perhaps unintentional, um, as I said, you know, biases in terms of uh, the ability of providing a track record is the way to go to, to ensure that this is a credible partner. And then there's no nuance to the different contexts and therefore the kinds of frameworks that risk frameworks that are uh, produced are very standardized and that's also difficult to reconcile with their different uh, context and, and, and realities. Uh, which also brings to another kind of a different risk, but an important risk, which is the risk of, because of, of all these sort of framings and, and perceptions and preconditions, uh, the risk of not supporting progressive movements and causes at all or, or in the way that are needed, right? And so I'm gonna just stop here by sharing that we've been really thinking that for us, what is very important in this, in this very moment is to try and build uh, more uh, ecosystems of solidarity, to really try and, and join forces amongst various donors, various enablers, various allies that could be like-minded on agendas like these, centering some of these conversations, strategies, and approaches, of course, on the realities, the visions, and the ambitions, and the ambitions of grassroots groups. And, uh, and we know that there are already uh, groups that are working in a more uh, collaborative, joined up and you know systemic way. And, 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 I'm, and I'm sure that some of the, of the guest speakers today can, can refer to some of their personal experiences, but I think there's more we can do to try and, uh, and be all more intentional in, in holding spaces like this um, and trying to come up with more joined up analysis, solutions, and see where we can complement uh, but also share some of the risks together uh, and um, and learn and as we go together, right? And, and relearn with the activists how to be in good solidarity and, and try to provide those vehicles uh, of solidarity and resources that they need. So I'm gonna stop there. I hope I did justice to all of the kind of work that Civicus has and, and our members and partners and, uh, and co colleagues have done over the last years. Uh, uh, but this is in a nutshell why we think these are three key elements and how we think moving forward we'd like to would like to see you know more joined up efforts. Uh, okay, so let me just stop sharing and finally turn to the amazing panel of speakers. Um, so I, I'd like to invite you all to, and I think you all have it already, your cameras are on, fantastic. And maybe would like to, to, I would like to ask you to introduce yourselves briefly and of course the organizations or initiatives you represent. Uh, I think we can proceed in alphabetical order if that's okay. So maybe we could start with Anne. Yes, hello everyone, and thank you very much for the presentation. It's so interesting. I'm Anne Louise Carstens. I'm from Denmark, working with Action Aid Denmark, and I'm heading what we call the Global Social Movement Center. Um, for the last more than 10 years, I've been part of, of Action Aid and 
and leading some of our work about youth-led activism and, and our movement work and support to movements has very much been like smaller pilots really testing what works well. And But one and a half year ago, we got like a, a, a an excellent flexible grant from Danita really to institutionalize and set up systems for, for how we work with movements. So now we have five regional hubs in Nigeria, Tanzania, El Salvador, India, and, and Denmark, and from where we support social movements with resources, uh, knowledge, and, and direct strategic support. Very happy to be here. And you are uh, muted. And then maybe I, I'm also encouraged to share a little bit in the chat on, uh, on what we do. And I'm going to share like a link uh, to to some of the resources of the Global Social Movement Center. And I'm also gonna share a link to uh, the Copenhagen People Power Conference that we are running uh, Thursday and Friday. It's also possible to participate online. We'll do it in partnership with among others, Civicus, so really also building on, on this work. And uh, we will have donors and politicians, and of course, a lot of grassroots. Uh, activists and different decision makers really with the aim to see how we can get new sectors to be better movement allies. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. Laura, you want to go next? Sure. I think uh, Ben was going uh, uh, before me because of uh, alphabetical order, but I'll pass it over to him afterwards. Uh, I'm Laura. Sorry, you're right. You're right. Ben. <laughs> no, well, I can start if you want, and I, I'll pass it over to Ben. Okay. Uh, I'm Laura Garcia. I'm originally from Mexico, and I'm the uh, president of Global Green Grants Fund. Uh, Global Green Grants has been in existence for 30 years. It's a, an organization that mobilizes resources to support uh, grassroots environmental justice movements around the world. Uh, we provide over um, 1,300 uh, grants per year to different groups and organizations. They are usually out of the radar of other funders, and they are um, uh, 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 a big number of, uh, of those grants goes to organizations who are receiving uh, funding for the first time. The way that we can do that globally is through a network of trusted advisors and allied organizations who are working uh, closely in those communities and regions of the world, and they form advisory networks, and we give uh, our grant making in a decentralized manner, meaning that these uh, networks of advisors and, and uh, comprised in boards, regional boards, uh, make the decisions of uh, who gets to, um, to, 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 who gets the funding and into what areas of work. And we have a very, Purposely, we have a very open approach to the different topics that we support around climate and environmental justice, uh, and we are we are also very intentional in uh, uh, supporting environmental justice and moving away from a conservation approach that doesn't uh, allow the um, uh, the 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 good. Um, a good um, a harmony and coexistence between people and planet. Uh, so we are uh, we are uh, embracing a human rights approach and social justice in our work as well. And uh, I'll stop there and pass it over to Ben. Sorry, Ben. No worries. Um, thanks so much. Um, really excited to be here with this these wonderful colleagues, wonderful women doing amazing work. Um, I'm Ben Neymar Grouse, Social Movements Advisor with the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, I've, over my career, sat on both sides of the donor table, designing portfolios, giving grants, evaluating them, and then applying for them, begging for them, being rejected for, <laughs> for them, um, reporting on them. So I sort of bring that experience to my research on movements. For the last decade, I've been a scholar of social movements, particularly resourcing of movements. Um, and recently I joined USAID as this, in this position as social movements advisor. It's, if I'm not wrong, it's the first full-time movements advisor anywhere in the US government. So it's a, it's a um, sort of a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, um, challenges and such, um, as I think many of us have, have, uh, have experienced in this space. But in this role, I'm focused on expanding USAID's collective knowledge about movements 
and expanding USAID's ability to support the movement ecosystem and systems around the world. So that includes showing up when invited, adhering to, to the do no harm principle and, and to helping where we can. Um, so I'm here to share some of primarily um, knowledge and experience from, from my and others research and also to, to learn and, and be here in community with, with all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Ben. Maria Malia, you wanna go next? No, I'm stressed, <laughs> I'm missing the order. No, I think no, this is this is the next one. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Maria Malia. So, so from, well, I founded this, this grant disbursement structure in South America, although we were activists and knew nothing about <laughs> grant making uh, back 20 years ago or so. But, uh, and I think this is where I'm going to be. This is my place of, of speaking here uh, for this conference because um, it's, uh, it's very different. No, when you are part of an ecosystem and a struggle, many of us, and you're invisible <laughs> to everybody. And, you see that resources arrive in the hands of large organizations, mostly the huge ones, international ones, and the very large national ones, and are trying to achieve protection of important biomes, which is our perspective here, socio-environmental is how we call it. And this is a word that only exists for 30 years, actually, 31, <laughs> it was created. This was a concept created around the Rio 92 conference that Brazil hosted back in 92. And so we were activists trying to figure out how do you get resources to the hands of people doing all kinds of, of things to protect the important places that we have in this region. Um, this has been 20 years ago, but we had to learn everything. We had to decide we have to do this because it's never going to happen if we don't come together and figure out a system that actually gets resources to the hands of groups that are parts of our causes. So I'm just going to leave before I you know, go on later to explain a little bit more about Casa Fund and, and then the the replication of the model. So we actually invented a specific different model. We did not copy the philanthropic structures uh, of the conventional philanthropy that we already knew because that wasn't working for us. So we had to actually create one. We've tested it and improved for the last 18 years. And we realized that anybody, any activist anywhere could use this, this model for any cause, not even just our cause. So we actually shared the model and coached the creation of five new funds, four in South America, one in Africa and Mozambique. And all of us together with older, similar funds that existed for a while, but we're too few to create a movement. <laughs> we were four, now we are nine, and actually now we are 10 in this alliance that's brand new. It's called the Socio-Environmental Funds of the Global South Alliance. It's very particular. So one thing I was going to leave here before we I my next my next speaker, we do not we do not call ourselves intermediary funds. <laughs> Every time somebody says that, it just ah, it just makes me really uh, aware of that the the nomenclature the you know, how qualification exists in the field and how. We are something so different from what existed before us that we, and in our countries, Latin, at least the Latin languages, intermediaries is, are, mean the, the middleman, the one that takes advantage of some of the ones that can't really access. So we call ourselves bridges or activist funds. We are bridges for large foundations to access this whole world that exists and needs to be funded. And we are buffers for those groups that are inexperienced that really need to be uh, welcomed and embraced and, and you know, begin to get, get resources for the first time. So this is where I'm Thanks, going Amalia. to, it's a whole other 
world out here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess Nino can go next. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Nino, originally from Georgia, but I am based in Barcelona. So like migrant, queer, fresh dog parent is what would describe me best. I spent um, 11 years in feminist philanthropy um, and I exactly one year ago. Today is like anniversary of um, a collaborative fund that I co-founded um, with a few activists from uh, Cessna regions, which stands for Central and Eastern Europe, Caucasus, Central North Asia, basically what you would know as post-Soviet countries, um, plus those that are most directly impacted by current invasion of Ukraine. So, um, and I'm going to dive deeper as to like, what are we working on? But basically, precisely taking, um, I guess, the leadership in our own hands and saying how we want to be resourced as an activist-led fund is what we are doing. Um, so we are work setting up an infrastructure and strategy together with local organizers and movements to ensure that we are really in tune with what's going on in our regions. And basically the logic of the fund works around four dimensions of crisis, which is prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. So, so that we, we like holistically look at different stages of let's just first of all prevent it if we can, and then how does long-term recovery look like within this framework plus how can we think about long-term strategies about beautiful times that someday will come? Because not always we need to talk about crisis because in my region, we have crisis after crisis to the point that it's very difficult to stop and take a breath. So um, basically what we are doing is find the balance between these two. I'm gonna talk about this uh, more later, but gonna pass the mic back to you, Clara, for the sake of time, I guess. Thanks, yeah, ten design, please go ahead. Yes, thanks so much. Good day, everyone. My name is Tendi Sai Chiguerere. Uh, I'm a global citizen who's lived and worked in Latin America and North America, and currently I'm residing in Zimbabwe and working across the African continent. I work with Trust Africa, which is a Pan-African philanthropic foundation, which supports community agency across the domains of democracy and governance, equitable development, and African philanthropy. And the name of our organization came from the call to literally trust Africa with substantive resources for the transformative processes that are needed, uh, to trust Africa to come up with the solutions to the most pressing needs facing the continent, and also to trust Africa to be the agents of this transformation. So really our ethos around agency forces us to interrogate what that requires in terms of our relationships with movements. So not instrumentalizing them, but really genuinely seeing them as agents of change which are rooted in constituencies and have intersectional dimensions. And I think this framing of agency for us also invites us to interrogate what solidarity means and how we show up in our relationships with movements. Uh, for us, we really consider ourselves embedded actors because we're not only invested in the issues being championed by movements, but we're also trying to move the arc of justice towards greater progress. So for us, solidarity really means having skin in the game. And I always say that there is no plan B. And when we talk about our continent, there is no plan B. It's us or it's us. So I'm really excited to be here today and be in this conversation with all these amazing people and all the all the participants as well. Thanks, Clara. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tendisai. And uh, I am mindful of time. I, it's my fault. I think I went a bit over time with my presentation. But I would like to suggest also to keep... Um, um, people curious and enticed about this incredible panel that I told you was stellar, and now you know why, uh, that we do perhaps now a 10 minutes break to give a um, break to the interpreters most than anything, uh, and that we come back really on time. I hope you can come back in eight minutes, really. So uh, uh, five past whatever, uh, five past seven. <laughs> Uh, so we can really start in 10 minutes straight and, and we dive into this um, exchange with, with all of you. Uh, thank you very much. Not five best. You silly.
by everyone. Please start coming back so we can start on time. Thanks, Maria Amalia. You're back. I can see you. Welcome back. Can this I? No, Ben, Laura. I think we're almost there. Thanks. A few more seconds and then we'll start. Yesenia, do you know if the interpreters are back? Can we start? Shall we wait a bit more? Let me check on the chat. Jan, welcome back. Ron is here. Ready. <laughs> Um, both are ready all right so let's start um and the idea of of this part of the session is really to have an informal exchange uh in a conversation with with all of you um weaving uh, a bit of you know, ref reflections around these three key elements that for us at least stood out as as key elements and so i'd like to maybe start um unpacking or addressing the aspect of relationships, which for us was what clear, what came out more strongly uh, uh, throughout our, our uh, you know, engagements. And, uh, and we've heard no loud and clear relationships and the relational cultures are key eh? uh, for, 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 for activists, for grassroots activists. So I'd like to turn immediately to Laura, um, as when I think about meaningful relationships with grant, uh, with grant makers, Global Green Grants Fund and its participatory approach is, is immediately something now that comes that comes to mind. And, and I'd be very, very curious to, to, to hear from you, Laura, uh, also because I know that there's a new vision that the Global Green Grant Funds is um, developing. And so uh, I'd like to understand a bit more. Uh, about that. It seems like uh, this new vision is centered around more horizontal relationships with grassroots, um, but also with a larger ecosystem. So really, can you share with us what drove this kind of change in vision and, and how this new approach to relationships might depart or evolve from, from your previous approach? And, and um, if there are any specific changes that you're looking at implementing to uh, become a better ally um, and you know, according to this new vision. So over to you. Thank you, Clara. Um, I, I think I, I want to start with something that I feel it's important, which is to say that if we decontextualize relationships and what that means, and we don't provide the 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 an analysis of the context by which relationships have eroded into transactional, then we depoliticize the conversation because it's not just about good people with good intentions and trying to be better at you know personally and as human beings. I think that what we need to actually tackle is the system that has enabled the wrong kind of relationships to happen. What is that system? Because if if not, then relationship becomes kind of a, I would say a, a depoliticized conversation from the actual problem, which is the, the, the huge inequalities that happen in philanthropy and the structure and the system and how that system operates, which allows uh, or, or enables people within that system to behave in certain ways because that system is telling them to behave that way. So what I want to say is um, less than 2% of philanthropy goes to the grassroots. So that, uh, uh, that puts us in a, in, a, in, a scarce, in a framework of scarcity that has invited people within that system to compete with one another and to start behaving in ways that are obvious, you know, that are described in, in the way that you described, Carla, in your in your previous presentation. And 
I think that that's, that's the root of the problem. Uh, the fact that there is a concentration of power and money in the North, uh, very similar to, you know, uh, uh, resembling and, uh, and responding to the economic system and the way that we have uh, that we have uh, distributed wealth in the world. Of course, you know, with that system, there's going to be bad behaviors. Uh, but those bad behaviors and 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 relationship building, not of trust but of power, is going to then continue to reinforce uh, itself. And I think that for that, uh, when I when I moved to Green Grants because Green Grants is based in the global north, Green Grants is based in Boulder. Uh, I, I, I sometimes often say this, and I'm not uh, afraid of saying it publicly. The only reason why I decided to do that was in order to keep my own internal promise that I would go there and come to Green Grants with the with the with the intention of trying to do and and be committed to changing that system and to changing that uh, structure. And the way that I have um, thought about that uh, with my peers and colleagues and, you know, in the network of Green Grants is that because of the system, even though Green Grants was born out of the idea that decentralized decision making and grant making is the way forward 30 years ago. And Amalia, by the way, here is one of the founding members of, of, of this uh, uh, very innovative system that happened. 30 years ago, um, uh, Green Grants over time, uh, as any other regranting organization, and this is very um, important for me to say, we were working and Green Grants was working in a, in a context of, of scarcity and in a context of those disparities happening. And slowly, it uh, uh, we all have been uh, uh, learning from the system that the way that we can survive is through competition and and through trying to you know allocate resources in the way that we can but 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 it becomes a matter of survival uh to 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 do that and that's that's at least one root of the problem uh and and so with that um i I began because of the the root of the the working green grants is, is environmental justice as well. Uh, I I felt that it was very um, uh, um, you know a, a great timing and the the best organization to actually go back to its values and think of the nature the the intelligence that nature provides in 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 for 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 finding out what the right system is and, and changing within as, as a model for the change that we want to see outside. Uh, and this is, this is important. I think that uh, if we really want to shift philanthropy, we cannot do it if we don't start in our own house, in our own, in our own organizations. And in that sense, with uh, studying a little bit more on how nature behaves, Nature is a great inspirational source for all of us because human systems have been built uh, in uh, by by thinking about the wrong principles, principles around um, individualism, uh, competition, not collaborating, power, and obviously, you know, with power we can deconstruct it in many ways, uh, patriarchy. Uh, colonialism, capitalism, and all of those frame our human systems and institutions and organizations where the concentration of power and lack of democratization of resources is at the very center. Uh, and then if you look at nature, the 30 way that seconds, we... Laura, sorry, we are a bit on. Okay, on so well, the, what I want to, what I, the transformation that Green Trans is doing is uh, moving to an open source better connected system and changing within uh, in that system a uh, decentralized decision making uh, to and in a space where we can innovate a lot more and that that has been inspired by the way nature behaves and the shifts that we're trying to do in the larger um, sector i'll leave it there thank you laura thank you very much I'm turning to Amalia now, perhaps as a as a as a nice segue, and and again um, acknowledging uh, that 
you have dedicated many years not to ensure that resources reach the most um, excluded or vulnerable groups uh, working uh, in some of the most important and biodiverse places in the world. So indigenous communities, land defenders, riverside communities. And so again, going back to the aspect of relationships, no, I wanted to, to understand a bit better from your own experience with the Fondo Casa and, and the Alliance that, that you are part of. Um, so how are you managing to build these trust-based relationships with communities that you know, might be located far away from where you are? And how much do you think that you know, infrastructure that is proximate geographically or culturally, how much that is no, how much important is that in the sense of, or not so much, but um, yeah, your thoughts on building relationships with groups that might be, you know, distant and far away from where you are. Well, <clears throat> coming into this work from the perspective we just heard, <laughs> or observing it, because I was in the U.S. for many years, and I was trying to understand how do you break barriers, uh, once we decided to create an activist-led fund in the Global South, we began to use our own values, which you know, in, 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 the, in the Global South, and we're using that as a political term, so it's not geographical. So it's not just the Southern Hemisphere. It's about it, anywhere where people are vulnerable, excluded, and disenfranchised. So anywhere, okay? But all of, the, all of these characteristics uh, make up make up for the most generous people you can ever find and meet in this planet. The people who have less are the ones who share the most, and 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 by relating to them. So we activists were working in different fields here in our region with indigenous groups, with uh, Afro descendants from across. Uh, the the region with riverine com communities, we all work already involved a lot of relationships. One thing that uh, mostly Brazil but South America did really well, the environmental movement, was to work together. From the very start, we the little the groups that wanted to do something in the region where they were, they realized that if they didn't come together, they would have no voice. You know, it's very easy for a very large organization to call up the minister and have a meeting. But little groups all across, the ones most affected by the, the challenges, the environmental destruction, had no voice unless it came together. So all of these networks began to, to organize and they were already building up strongly in the 90s. That's where we came from. So we were born from relationship, <laughs> from, from shared vision. And we developed a system that actually was able to to use the knowledge of the system to create uh, a response. So all of our systems uh, were designed to respond to a wide range of players. So in comparison, let's say, with the Northern Solidarity Fund, so we don't call them intermediaries either, <laughs> no green grants and others like that. They were solidarity funds. They, the people over there who understood that they needed to break this system from inside, put, putting money outside, but there's only so much you can do from the outside, right? Don't, no matter how best intentions, there's numbers, there are systems that use uh, knowledge of a few people because that's what you can do when you are not in the system. But when you are, you don't need to, to create these uh, systems of, of gates. No, I don't want to say gatekeeping in the in the bad way, but it, none of us know everything or know everybody. So every time you choose an individual to have, to no to to be the 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 gate, you know the 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 entryway to something, it will create gates. No gatekeeping with the best of intentions, with the best of passions of all of them. So we decided we didn't want, we couldn't do that. So we needed to tap into the knowledge of the system as, as it enter, uh, wove across the territory. So that's how our system was built. So it was a whole other uh, world. But anyway, so this is the, the relationships part <laughs> that you. I think is very important to understand when you are a local, working locally, in local currency, which is 
the only way to reach the really unreachable. You have to create our systems locally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amalia. And um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Nino, perhaps, to unpack more uh, the aspect of resources. No, Amalia mm -hmm. was, was mentioning a couple of things that I think could be interesting to, to further exchange uh, with you, Nino. The aspect of designing systems to respond to the needs and to the realities um, and uh, and the need to be really in connection no, with the local uh, with the local community. So, looking at resources, no, thinking about resources and uh, in 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 the most broad sense. Um, so, I'd, I'd like to to ask you, no, in your in your year or more uh, in anal analyzing and understanding the needs, the resourcing mm -hmm. needs of the movements of the region that the Cessna Fund is aimed to support. Um, yeah, what are the critical resourcing gaps you have identified for the region? I know you, I know you've done a lot of, of research and work a lot in Ukraine, mm -hmm. so probably sparked from mm -hmm. from that crisis. Mm -hmm. And how are you trying to address these critical gaps through this mechanism yeah. through the Cessna fund? Thanks. Well, I would probably start from the point that Laura made that only one percent of funding goes to grassroots, and even less goes to our region, and it's been historically underfunded is literally how you would describe um, Cessna regions as in like Central Eastern Europe, Caucasus, or Central North Asia. It's very important to spell this out because first of all, we call these regions, not just one region. And the only reason why usually you would group it in one is very colonial thinking of Soviet Union. So we try to really decolonize and unmerge because we are very similar, but in many ways, we're also very different. So accommodating those in terms of what kind of resources we provide is going to be very critical. Um, yeah, I think a few points. You're very right. The fund came out because of the invasion of Ukraine. We saw how much money there was for suddenly for Ukraine. And yes, we are working in the mindset of resource scarcity, right? And we always thought there's no money for us. It's it's just, it is what it is. But the war has shown in Ukraine that there is some money, but the money is not going in right ways to right people. And we decided that it's time for us to bring our own expertise and help philanthropy understand that contextual nuances that one needs to know in order to better resource the movements because these relationships and risk aversion, all of this comes because people don't understand. People in philanthropy does not understand, do not understand where are some contextual details that one really needs to know and really take into consideration because otherwise money harms and that's literally what we have seen. A lot of money that has come uh, has really damaged the frag and has fragmented more organizing art in our regions. So kind of building that solidarity while bringing this money in is what we are, the challenge that we are kind of up against. And I mentioned the crisis as a dimension of work that we are working. There are, there's a logic of one crisis at the time. And we really have to move away from that because there's Ukraine, yes, but also there's nagorno karabakh happening right as we speak. And like moving this money in a way that does not divide people further is at the very core of um, how we operate. And I mentioned that we are centering people's visions as to how money should be distributed and we are building participatory grant making model precisely for that. And there's a lot to learn, for, for example, from Green Grants and yay to you because Green Grants recently opened new program in Central Asia and I'm sure you have a whole bunch of learnings about our region. Um, that's a conversation for another day, but still. Um, yes, we are really centering intergenerational trauma that lots of activists bring into the conversations because this, how we have been deprioritized in philanthropy, it, it has reasons and it has consequences. And the, I mentioned we are very fragmented, so healing really has to be a very foundational part of what we do, but also safety and security. All of this needs money, healing, safety and security. This is money we are talking about. We need to allocate a lot of money to make sure that we do not harm even further. So I think as we are thinking of what is our grant making model, what is the amount of money we are given for direct grant making, we have to also make sure we are providing other types of support. Um, and for example, we have been asked to give um, fiscal hosting um, option for, for the local organizers because many of them cannot afford operating in 
really already shrinked civil society spaces. So there's far more of what we can do as funders, especially as grassroots based, based funders. And I guess community foundations are also a very good example of different types of models and proximities to um, grassroots organizing that, that uh, philanthropy can really learn from. Um, and I guess the last point I'm gonna make is that we do a lot of horizon scanning and scenario planning together with organizers because we know that movements know when something is coming. For example, Bolsonaro, I remember Amalia, you were talking, I, I don't even remember what year was it, but you were talking about this for so long that it's coming, it's gonna happen. No one did anything and then Bolsonaro happened, right? So movements know and movements in our regions also know. So how to listen to that and practically support is the question that we really try to understand and fundraise for. And again, fundraising for our region is a really big challenge, but fingers crossed that we are gonna like move um, and shift some of the tides over there because otherwise we see what happens in Ukraine and this is just the beginning. And the way money has been moving so far is that it's focused, it's focusing on Central Eastern Europe, but it doesn't really understand the large impact globally, but also specifically on Caucasus and Central Asia in our case. So I guess helping funders to expand the logic and understand nuances is the challenge each of us are up against. So I'm gonna just stop it here. I could Very talk about this forever, but you don't know <laughs> you don't need the podcast from me. Um, so happy to <laughs> answer some of the questions um, that may come up after. Thank you so much, Nino. Thank you. And uh, actually, I'd like now to turn to Ten Desai um, and 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 check also. You know, from from Trust Africa perspective, uh, you know, what are the kinds of things that you're um, hearing and, and doing with the social movements that you're trying to support? Uh, Trust Africa is committed, I, I believe, to catalyzing more and better resources for social movements. And you are co-designing or you've recently established, I, I'm not sure uh, what's the stage there, uh, the Africa Social Movement Fund. So I'd be curious to hear from you, you know, what kinds of resources are most needed right now in the region? But also, how are you engaging donors, um, you know, to be an active ally and partner uh, to this endeavor? Thanks so much for that prompt, Clara. And just before I start, I just want to say 100% to everything Lara said earlier. You know, in systems change process, they always say a system is perfectly designed to produce the results it produces. So there's something there that's very deep that we all need to interrogate in the field. If I come to our experience as Trust Africa, I think uh, what I'd share is like in the five last five years or so, we started hosting what's called the African Social Movements Baraza. And this has really been in response to one of the biggest requests that we fielded hearing from movements around creating space, space, space. So spaces for their own community building and solidarity with each other. We've even had experiences where, you know, the, the movements have said, we actually don't even want you to show up. Just let us have the space, whether it's physical space or convening space or whatever it is connect us to your people who can bring in some political education pieces for us, but we just need the space. Spaces for sharing strategies around organizing, mobilizing, campaigning, and advocacy. A lot around spaces for collectively unpacking the moment. Um, I think as Nino was speaking right now, there's so much of a global moment that's happening that's so interconnected with so many big issues and these intersectional dimensions on the issues that they're championing. And then spaces for building more horizontal relationships with donors as allies in their movement processes. So this Baraza has kind of become an important process for us in terms of deepening direct relationships, both with and amongst movements um, for intergenerational political education in terms of understanding how interconnected the issues are and what we can remember. And we even use the term re with a, with a, a hash in between member you know, rebuild in terms of where we've come from as movements and not forgetting the, the historical generations that have come before us. So even the, the first Baraza that we had was probably more pro-democracy um, movements that were represented. But in the second Baraza, it became very evident that the intersectionality of all these issues, these poly crises that we're facing really needed to have a holistic approach. And so it really brought together movements around democracy and governance, the global economy and its impact on Africa, climate justice and just transition. And it's also become quite an important place for funding partners to be able to sit and listen and kind of work through, learn and learn what it means to be in solidarity with the journey that movements are on and really have frank conversations about what's not working, 
what needs adjusting in terms of how we relate to social movements, especially I think it was Nino that was also referencing that when it becomes distortive or divisive in the space rather than supportive. Um, and also for us, it's also become an important process in terms of exploring how we nurture well-being and self-care because we're seeing so much of how these spaces are often very wounded spaces and communities and especially amongst themselves as well. So how do we start to nurture that using arts, somatic and mindfulness practices, as well as even some of the livelihood issues we talked about around emergency response. And you know, Clara, I think another thing we're hearing from movements is a space to prototype and experiment. You know, there's a, a fluidity and a dynamism that we're called to be open to because there is no optimal intervention point with movements but our solidarity can be responsive to the movements and the ebbs and flows of movement realities. So it was actually quite encouraging to hear, you know, even in your earlier presentation, in terms of how Civicus's approach has been kind of integrating so many different facets and kind of experimenting and prototyping around that. In terms Thanks. of the, I'll say this very quickly, you know, yeah. we've prototyped in the past had a collaborative model and we find ourselves again now revisiting that process out of, you know, a call from movements where we're trying to make it more participatory, more fit for purpose. And at this process, we're also developing a mass campaign for more new and better resources. And speaking to the point made earlier, I think by Lara as well, coming out of this abundance mentality that there is more available, there is enough available to be able to champion all these dignified um, issues. So I can't emphasize enough that for us, it's quite a lot about looking at the sites of organizing as well. It's not just about directly only to the movements, but really the infrastructure, the ecosystem that supports movement to emerge. You know, we don't believe that a movement just emerges overnight, but it's really rooted in a process of historical organizing. So how do we support and bring resources to those sites of organizing? I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Tandizai. Thank you so much. So much resonance, I think, uh, across the board. Uh, and talking about spaces, space, 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 I'd like to turn to Anne, uh, who, um, who, who could bring us some additional perspectives from the experience of an INGO. Huh? And uh, actually, Denmark is, um, is really also trying to adapt to the current needs of social movements. So I'd like to ask you, Anne, um, how are you at Action Aid identifying these kinds of needs timely? And if you have any kind of examples of, of, uh, of types of support and offerings beyond grants, no? like for instance, spaces, if that's, if that's one of them, that you are developing in response to what you've heard the movements need and value from international allies like you. Yes, to you. thank you so much. Um, Yes, so, so following up on the, on the discussion on spaces and the need for, for safe spaces to meet and organize, I think one of the ways that we are present and, and able to, to understand needs on the ground is through this network that we call Global Platforms, is, is, is actual physical spaces um, that's supported um, through the Action Aid Federation. It's not always kind of hosted with Action Aid, actually it's working best when it's with partners, it's it, when it's very independent, but it's offering like an actual space where you can meet and organize and receive training. And, and for the moment, we have more than 70 of those connected virtually. And last week, all uh, were, were doing actions in, in relation to climate justice. So more than 400,000 people were mobilized across the globe. Um, but this is really like an, an entry point often to get uh, connected to some of the informal youth-led movements on the ground. Um, and, and the support we give is, is, is not so much related on grant making, but more on, on capacity. Um, and some of the things that, that have been kind of developed over the years based on trial and error is, is really to explore how, um, how to offer tailored capacity to the phase the movement is in. Um, so inspired by Bill Moyer's movement cycle, really to look at, okay, are you in the peak or in the entry or in a moment of crisis and what resources and tactics are then relevant to offer and who are the, what other movements uh, across the world are in, in similar spaces. 
um, who could who, who you can then share tactics with. Um, and I wanted to also say to Nino that we're at the moment expanding the the global platform network to Georgia, Ukraine, and Romania. So also kind of <laughs> moving uh, to, to to that part of the world. Um, but I think what what we have uh, in terms of resources, I think really like like actively using the movement cycle is something that that we have found is really working so we have like a movement assessment tool to help like when 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 the movement is is uh, is is being connected to in one of the regional hubs to to help assess where you are um and then we are developing um, so one of the links i shared uh, we have like a global um an online course but also with the uh, trainers uh, attached to it to deliver face-to-face uh, -face trainings. Um, it's called GOLD, Global Organizing and Leadership Development. And here we have also launched like specific training. Um, the idea with the GOLD course is not to have like the trainings where you need to exclude a lot. You have thousands that apply and uh, 20 that are allowed, but really to say, all that is online is available for everyone. Um, so everyone are welcome, but commitment follows commitment also from our end. So the most dedicated and committed learners can then be the ones also uh, that, that are then offered more specific and tailored support, access to mentors or other things. Um, uh, and then I can really relate to the, to the work, uh, to the comment about uh, the wounds and the, the needs, I think, when we we have like an annual people power forum for movements, really to base it on on their agenda and sharings, um, and there's such a need for for those spaces also just to to share the struggles um, that people are in, and and one of the needs that came up from a recent people power forum we had in February was uh, a desire to have more movement swaps. Um, so the possibility to actually, uh, you know, stay for a longer period of time to get lessons learned from each other. So that's something that we are piloting right now, three places. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing all, all these practices. I am a bit mindful of time. I hope it's okay to stay another five minutes together, at least to exchange a bit further with Ben and maybe have a final round of, of reflections. Um, so I'd like to really now move quickly to the risk uh, angle, uh, which um, I think you know, it's, it's, it's an important one. And, and I'm really pleased to turn now to Ben to maybe help us unpack that, uh, that further. Uh, ben, so in your report, Dollars and Descent, you do reveal some perceptions and tensions behind um, these attitudes of donors mostly towards risk. Uh, but also some of the consequences now that derive from from those. Uh, what would you say are the main main reasons behind this risk aversion, risk attitudes? I don't know how to define that, and um, yeah, and the consequences of that to promoting social causes and supporting social causes writ large. Uh, do you know of successful examples, for example, that um, of, of a couple of donors that? are managing to navigate some of those tensions when it comes to risk. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Clara and, and Civica's colleagues for organizing and for my fellow pan panelists for, for the um, learnings and, and suggestions. I think from, from sort of academic scholarship and, and practice, there really tend to be three sort of baskets of things that, that um, sort of keep donors hesitant or keep from supporting movements or keep donors from, from supporting organizing and movements. And when I say donors, this could be, you know, all, all sorts of public charities, private foundations, um, you know, whole, whole range. And so the first is relates to the sort of institutional structures of, of donors. Um, these structures can often create a bias or, or push um, donors uh, to, to other kinds of philanthropy to supporting other kinds of, of social change. Um, and the, the sort of these tendencies or bias tends to begin long before a program officer sort of decides on which proposals to fund or not, right? So the, you know, requiring grantees to have registered 501c3 status and, and these sorts of things. Um, often movements and, and grassroots organizations, they're decentralized. So they're organized outside of formal institutions by strategic choice. 
Um, and so it's the very form and function that makes them maybe difficult for some donors to support is also what makes them powerful. Um, so this is some of the research suggests that, you know, it's, it's important for donors and, and sort of intermediaries or, or those supporting from abroad to um, look internally at the operations, the, the uh, departments and colleagues, not just sort of the thematic or, or geographic staff to help uh, oper operationalize trust with instead of control over um, um, grantees. Um, the second common obstacle relates to sort of the expertise or values relationships held by uh, leadership um, or staff of, of, a, of, a, of a donor. Um, so often the expertise is in advocacy or law or, or philanthropy, um, less so in organizing or movements. I think the panel here put many of the exceptions <laughs> to, to that. Um, there's nothing wrong with having experience in, in advocacy or such, but it, it can implicitly sort of make it easier for a donor to support the things they know rather than um, the things that they often relate to, to movements and, and organizing. Um, and so there's, you know, there's important to develop that expertise, whether it's through panels like this, Human Rights Funders Network, Alliance for Feminist Movements, there are these spaces that donors and activists can come together and do come together to, to learn, to become proximate with each other, to hold relationships um, um, to some of those spaces. And finally, the sort of hesitancy often um, comes because the donors perceive this kind of grant making as risky or messy, right? And messy because goals and, and strategies often shift quickly when it comes to organizing and, and movements. Um, and sometimes the tactics or demands may make us uncomfortable or we may not, not sort of uh, recognize them um, um, as effective. Um, and so it's important to just recall that the, one of the greatest powers of, of a movement, of movements, is, is not necessarily their ability to, to encourage sort of policy reform, but their ability to shift the Overton window, to, to expand what people imagine can be possible in their societies. Um, and so, you know, shifting norms around gender equality or, or um, expanding democracy in a context of backsliding might be harder or messier than providing laptops to, to kids, um, but, but strategies and practices exist to support and measure and evaluate this sort of perceived messy work. So the American Jewish World Service, the Global Fund for Women, both have sort of assessment tools um, that are you know, accessible online, others as well, for understanding and measuring and, and, and doing this sort of work. And I just sort of finished by making two points. One is that, um, you know, a colleague described, sort of responded to this idea of movements being messy and said, it's, it's this messiness that gives this work its integrity. Um, and to sort of keep that, hold that in mind as we, as we think about the opportunities and challenges here. Um, and finally, it's just to say that, you know, because this work is, is challenging and because of the sort of real and imagined risks involved, that we, we need to be honest with ourselves about what our particular, you know, donor or foundation or intermediary can do, can't do, is better at, or is, is maybe not as well placed to do, and to coordinate with each other, to talk with each other, to, to not step on each other's toes, to, to, to fill gaps where we're... Um, to allow others to fill gaps where, where we may, may not be able to. So I'll, I'll end there and I'm happy to, to reflect on any of these points more deeply in, in the conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Benjamin. Uh, ben, uh, I've done a really poor job in, in time management. I'm sorry because we are uh, almost uh, or already over time. Uh, so I'm afraid there might be not uh, time for the Q&A moment, but I would certainly like to ask um, um, our guest speakers to share one final comment or reflection, either about what they've heard or something that we haven't tackled that they feel it should be actually something important to, to share in, in, in this sense. I'm, I'm going to give you really just one minute. I'm sorry about that, uh, but um, I, I, I think it would be interesting to a final round of, of final remarks. So maybe I, we could start um, with Tendi Sai this time. Thanks so much, Claire. I think I'll just uh, share back with you a poem as my last reflection that I penned a few years ago. And a lot of the points have come out again um, around these relationships. And it's called To Be or Not To Be With. Is that even a question? Community as leader, community as process. 
when all the acronyms fade away and the jargon moves to the periphery, all that remains true are the stands we call community. Decades of debate and research of the factors that enable communities to act. And what do we know? Exactly what we repeatedly forget. Community is the center of transformative process and social change. Why do we shy away from the only truth that has withstood the test of time? Something to do with time. It takes time to sit with community as it meets itself and remembers. It takes time to allow for the messiness to play out. It takes time to follow the unpredictability of finding a rhythm. It takes time to get to a place of authenticity with self and with other. It takes time to walk alongside community in reclaiming dignity. It takes time to fail forward and fail backward without avail. It takes time to track with what may seem like bushwhacking through processes for collective well being. It takes time to discern how to transform the irreconcilable. It takes time to learn the dance and song which brings community to life. It takes time to discern the parts and to see the whole. No matter how you word it, the inquiry remains the same. Do we have the time? Do we give the time? Are we ready for time to pass? Are we prepared for all it entails to be with? Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you. Um, Nino, you want to go next? Yeah, actually, one thing I'm sitting with is just a huge appreciation for the wealth of knowledge that is already in this very Zoom um, space because. <laughs> A lot of inspiration and um, visions for where we want to go in the field in philanthropy is really coming from like faces we see on the screen right now. And I really appreciate the opportunity to learn because this community and the, the experiences that are very different in so many ways, but also so similar are really foundational. And we cannot crack the system individually. I really appreciate this coming together and like cracking it together from different points um, because ultimately it will. Uh, question is uh, the timing. And I guess the more we pressure together, the better. So I guess my last point is precisely like appreciation for the community that we have internally in philanthropy and especially the feminist philanthropy because lots of the transformative conversations that I feel like we really heavily lean on um, is happening right there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nino. I see that Laura had to go. Of course, we are running out of time, so um, um, I understand. Uh, Maria Malia, do you want to share one final thought? Yeah, well, following what Nino just said, uh, it it is about doing it together, but truly, because you know sometimes we just tell the stories from our perspectives, but very rarely we actually sit together and figure out what are the, the, the complementarities of what we're doing? Because we need to crack the system. It's, it's actually beginning. And one of them, at least from our perspective and the reason we created this group of Global South Funds is, is a very strong narrative. We have the systems, but we're not getting the resources uh, down here. Somebody's getting it to do work for us in our regions. And it's time that we, those who are there, and that's what Laura was talking about, you know, help help to also crack that system to, to strengthen us as well. So there's a lot, there's room for everybody. There is abundance. And I think that that's the big lesson that we learned here in, the, in creating this alliance, that all of the new funds got money right away. They are mobilizing internally, inclusive, inclusive in our countries. We So there, there there's a lot of, good things that we can do but we need to be able to do and not just you know somehow there's got to be a place that we actually can sit and and distribute tasks and and move together just one uh just one invitation on on october 12th human rights funders network which i you know i've been on their steering committee and I'm missing the board meeting to be here today, uh, is launching a very interesting study about the trust gap in human rights philanthropy, North and South. 
And there's been a lot of very interesting findings. And I think that that document was going to help a, a lot of us in our, in, from where we are to, to continue cracking the system. So I hope you are there. We're going to figure out a way to share the, the information. But I, I know there's going to be two sessions, Eastern Time, 9, 10, and then 12, 11 on October 12th. And then more details coming soon. <laughs> Thank Fantastic. you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Amalia. Ben, you want to go next? Sure. Thank you. I, just to to say, you know, that I think many of us ex, sort of ex, have, have seen this in practice, but to to always keep it top of mind is that movements win primarily because of the power they build within their own communities, right? They, not because of who supports them from abroad or, or or what support they get from abroad. That doesn't mean we pack up and go home. It's a, it's, a, it's a call to what, Clara, you put on the screen early on, which is that outside support should then be designed to support the agency, the resiliency, the efficacy of the people doing this work. Um, and, and, and for those of us who are out trying to support from outside, it's a call to do it out of solidarity and, and in the ways and in the moments that, that we're invited to, to do it. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Represent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, last but not least. So I was actually a little uh, stressed out because we have 250 people at a conference on Thursday, but I'm really happy that I prioritized to be here because really important points uh, was raised and it's something I take with me. Um, we're kind of I'm hosting a session with different donors and uh, I realized I used the word intermediary so many times in my script and I think I'm going to redo that uh, and um, and just yeah I think those reflections in terms of of actually the structural um, Im imbalance and um, really to address that more also in the conversations we're moving into is something I really take with me from this session so Really happy I prioritized it and looking forward to to continue the conversations. Thank you very much, Anne. And as we really now are drawing to a close, let me just read Laura's comment as she also had a final remark, but she's not here. So philanthropy needs to resource movements like it wants them to actually win. The great inequalities in funding are the biggest impediment for philanthropy to be successful. And with that, apologizing once more for my really poor time management, I want to thank you all, uh, thank all of you, uh, guest speakers, uh, because uh, it has been a very fascinating and, and rich conversation. And I hope, uh, as Amalia suggests, us encourages us to do that there will be more and better spaces to actually get to sit down and crack this together and you know, co-design co and co-create solutions and see where complementarities and gaps are. I really hope we can work more together on this. Thank you for all the, um, the people who joined us, who stayed with us over time. Thank you to the interpreters and of course to um, Yesenia.